Hello, everybody. Welcome to the afternoon, first day of TechCon 2023. Great uh, session so far. I hope you enjoyed Mark. And I'm your host, Brian Wilson, for the API management and gateways track. And uh, welcome to session, session 313, which should be fantastic. And so with that, I'm going to hand it right over to Salma to get us started. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our TechCon Talk, Async API and Managing Events, How They Work in Practice. Uh, my name is Salma Saeed. I am the Product Manager for Event Endpoint Management. And we also have Dale Lane, who is the Chief Architect for Event Integration. So let's just jump right in and start with the story. So here we have Acme Air. They're an airline company with flights all over the world. They have all of this data about their flights, where they are, what time they're going to arrive at their destination, and how many passengers were on board, things like that. But they have an ongoing problem with their baggage handling, and they often find when flights land, they don't have enough people or they don't have the right vehicle to collect all of the luggage. So they go to their developers and they say, how can you help us make sure that the baggage claim always knows what flights are going to arrive and how much luggage to expect? And the developers say, well, we could use Kafka. We can take all of the flight data and put it onto Kafka and then make it available for the baggage claim people. We can then build an application that will tell them what vehicle they should use and when they need to go and collect the luggage. So this is great because Kafka allows us to connect these two different parts of the organization and make better use of the flight data they have. So our developers build up this whole system and that's working great. But what happens when someone comes along and says, OK, well, we have all this data. What else could we do with it? And that's where we look at, you know, we have described our data, but how can we leverage this even more? So we've talked about how we can use Kafka to get the data out of our flight management system and use that to build a really effective baggage application system. But maybe you can take that same idea and start building a new application something around getting the taxis to the right place. So when a flight lands, the taxi drivers are notified, so they are ready to pick up passengers that are getting off these flights. So we have our developer here, and she's just working away when her boss comes to her with this new project idea. He explains that they want to use the flight system to push the notifications to taxi drivers, so they go to the right place where they're needed at the right time. <clears throat> So her boss mentions that this is incredibly urgent and that they need this right away. So she starts thinking how to do this and she starts thinking, well, if I could get this data onto a Kafka topic, then I could start doing stream processing and things like that. So she starts to put this together and gets a picture of what this is going to look like. If she can find a connector to get data out of their flight management system, get those flight landing events surfaced on a Kafka topic, then they can use that topic as a basis for a new application using those notifications to drive messages they're going to push to the taxi drivers. So as you can see, she has a clear idea of how she's going to tackle it. So she decides to start with this first part, getting the data out of the backend system and into a Kafka topic. So she goes looking to see if she can find any connectors and sure enough, there's actually a few connectors out there that say they will work with this flight management system. So she downloads all of them and tries to get started. But they're all quite confusing. They're really difficult to configure and the error messages don't make much sense. And she's not really sure which one she should use because it's all just so unclear. So she ends up spending a few days trying to get this to work. But, you know, she fights through it and battles with it. And eventually she gets it working. A few days later, she talks to another developer in a different team, talking about what she's been doing for the past few days, explaining that she's got this topic with all the live data coming out of the Acme Air system. And it's working really, really well. But he tells her, well, hang on a minute. I know another team of developers who have worked on that. So we've already got a topic with events from the system. You don't need to do any of that. So understandably, the developer who is already reasonably frustrated is now completely miserable because it turns out she's completely wasted her time on the super urgent project that she needs to get going very quickly. So she throws everything away that she's done so far. And instead, she decides to start from that topic that already exists and just focuses on how she's going to process those events and push the messages to the taxi drivers. 
So she starts looking at the messages on this topic that was set up for the baggage system, and she starts thinking about how she's going to use the application to process these events. She starts writing the stream processing app, but she can't find the developer who actually set up the messages on that topic that already exists. And the fields that are in these messages don't make that much sense. The names are really unclear. She can't really tell what this is about. So it takes her very long, way too long, to try and work out the data on these topics, what it means and how she's even supposed to use it. And so our developer is super, super unhappy. So what did we learn from our story? Well, the first being, how could our developer have known what Kafka clusters were available and what topics were available? So she didn't need to waste the time setting up a new topic. Once she'd found the topic, how could she have understood the data that is on the topic? And how could she have got that description and that helping hand for her to know how to use that data? And finally, when it's an urgent project like this one, how could she have got going as efficiently and quickly as possible? So these are the sorts of questions that we want to address and show you how the specification called Async API can help. Real, thank you for that. Um, hello, everyone. Um, what I like about that story is it shows that the, the crucial bit here is that cultural change of getting to a point where you start to treat Kafka topics as APIs and start sharing them and documenting and describing them to enable your colleagues to be efficient with them. But once you've got to that point where you're ready to start describing and documenting your topics, um, the next step is, is you need a way of doing that efficiently in a way that everyone's going to understand. Um, and that's, uh, as Sam was saying, that's kind of where we see Async API playing a really important role. Um, I'm going to sort of run you through the Async API spec to show you what an Async API document looks like. You know, what it, what it looks like to describe your Kafka document, uh, sorry, your Kafka topic, your applications with it. Uh, I'm not going to try and teach you the syntax. Um, there are some things we can point you at, like there's a really powerful editor and samples and documentation. Instead, my objective for this is to try and give you a flavor for it, kind of give you a bit of a taster so you get a feel for the kinds of things you can put in an async API doc. So with that, let's get started. There are, uh, so to start with, the async API doc is, it's either YAML or JSON. You can store it in either way. Uh, like I said, we're not going to sort of dive in and, and look at the details. So, um, but before we start jumping in, like I say, there are really good editors around. Um, so you don't have to be sort of hand cranking this, this YAML or JSON. Um, if you've ever written an open API document before, or it used to be called Swagger documents, then a lot of this will look really familiar to you. Um, a lot of the, the sort of history of Async API, it was heavily inspired by uh, open API. So it's got a lot of, sort of similarities in terms of structure and, and some of the, the contents in there. Um, but instead, what we're doing here is we're bringing it to um, asynchronous sources like Kafka. So like I say, the main thing I want to explain is what kinds of information would you find in an Async API document? Um, so these are the, the four main areas, and, and I'll sort of go through each one of these in turn. To start with, typically at the top, although, you know, this is YAML and JSON, the order doesn't really matter, but typically at the top, you'll find info. This is context setting. This is where you will put in um, a, a name, a title, a description. Uh, the description field lets you have markdown, so you can get really quite detailed and rich. You can include images and formatting, you know, simple formatting. Um, the idea of this bit is you're describing to the developer what these events are for, where this has come from, how it could be used. It's your chance to put forward the narrative and the context and the background. Um, as well as that, in this section, you've also got some specific bits. You've got a place to put contact details for who owns the topic. Um, like a name and an email address or a, a URL, which is really useful for if someone runs into trouble, it tells them exactly who they can reach out for. Um, some other metadata you'll find in here are things like um, li if there's any license restrictions around the use of the topic, the events on the topic, it would you've got a place to put that. Um, those kinds of things. Uh, let's move on. The next, oh, and I forgot to say, this is what this bit looks like. So again, I won't go into detail, but you see what I mean, that this is a, like a YAML version of it. Um, we've used a bit of markdown in here to show headings. We've included an image, some contact details, and a license. And this is kind of what it looks like. Um, let's move on. So the next section is servers. This is connectivity stuff. This is where you explain the address of your server. You know, so servers, because Async API doesn't have to be Kafka, although we're interested in talking about Kafka today, um, you can actually use Async API to describe a wide variety of protocols, um, MQ, MQTT, um, and many, many more besides. Um, 
So here you'll put in what type of server that you're talking about. So as you see here, we're talking about Kafka. So you've got that protocol space. Um, if there's a particular version that your servers are, particularly if that's going to influence the way people write their applications, you can specify that. Um, you can put, again, description, background, narrative. You know, it's really, we'll keep coming back to this idea, but it's that cultural shift of getting used to treating it like an API and describing it because developer documentation is only as good as the amount of detail that someone has put into it. But at a basic level, this is, uh, and actually, yeah, this is how you connect to the Kafka cluster. So if there's any security requirements, you know, if, if it's set up with SAS or Scram or SAS or Plain or that kind of thing, that'll be described here as well. After that, um, channels. Channels is kind of like the generic description for in what in Kafka we would think of as, as topics. Um, so here's where you're going to describe the, the Kafka topics, um, what they're called, um, and what data is going to be on those topics. Uh, so again, you get a place to put background and narrative. You've got a title field, a description field, place to put markdown, place to put some detailed description. Um, you've got a space to put um, a description of the message payload, both the, the body of the message and any headers. You know, are keys being used? Are headers being used? How are they used? What data types are there? All of that kind of thing. Everything that would allow a developer to know what to expect, what they'll find on that on that topic. Um, and enough information to help them parse, deserialize the data on that topic. Um, and you can use a variety of different sort of serialization techniques in here. So uh, particularly if you're coming from a Kafka background, you'll, you'll be familiar with things like Avro. Uh, you may have an Avro schema. You can embed that in an async API document, totally fine. Um, but you can use other types, um, uh, protobuf, uh, JSON, you know, you name it. The idea of the async API document is to be that wrapper, that envelope to, to hold the description of your topic and the message payload um, in there. And finally, um, there are, again, if you've used OpenAPI, if you've used Swagger before, you'll be familiar with this idea of components. You can um, make reusable pieces that you can reuse throughout the document, um, particularly useful if you're uh, writing multiple async API documents. So you don't have to copy, paste, repeat um, bits. You can uh, have a dollar ref to point at by reference um, a piece. So if there's a particular you know, message payload type that you use on several topics, your async API document doesn't have to duplicate that description of the payload. You put it once down in that component section, and then you refer to it in each of the topics where it's relevant. So that's, that's kind of the structure. Um, you've got uh, four main types of things you're putting in here. High level info, background, context, set the narrative, set the scene. Servers, how does someone to connect to your your servers, we you know where is the Kafka cluster? Channels is where you describe the topics. What's the topic called? What's the data on those topics? What does it look like? Um, and finally, to, to make it really efficient to avoid duplication, you've got a way of um, doing reusable components either within a document or across multiple documents. Um, and that's kind of what it's for. And hopefully that, that shows you how it can address um, the kind of problem that, that Salma described at the start. So as Dale just mentioned, <clears throat> you can use Async API as a way of socializing your Kafka topics in your organization, um, which will allow developers to discover the topics that are available to them and help them get started. So this is what we've used in IBM Event Endpoint Management, which we will demo for you now. But first, let's meet the team. So we have Siobhan and Andre who work at Acmea. So Siobhan is an API developer and Andre is an application developer. Let's start with Siobhan. So Siobhan has created a topic on a Kafka cluster and is running the Acme Air flight landing system to that topic. Siobhan was part of the team that initially wrote this and she has been made aware of the situation that occurred and realized that other developers in her organization, such as Andre, would find other uses for the stream of events. <clears throat> so Siobhan is going to publish the flight landing stream of events where it can be shared so other developers can discover it and then use it in their application in a managed and secured way. <clears throat> So starting from the dashboard in Cloudback for integration, Siobhan clicks on the instance of Event Endpoint Management and signs on as required to land on the API Manager homepage. This is where Siobhan can describe her Kafka topics and then publish it to a centralized portal so others in her organization can make use of it. And as you can see, there are a couple of APIs here already, but none of them are around flights and there aren't any products relating to flights either. So the first thing she's going to do is create a product. A product is a logical group of related APIs. So Siobhan creates a flight product to hold the new flight landing API she was about to create. This then means that when other APIs are created around flights, such as flight arrivals, perhaps flight delays, things like that, they can be added to this product. 
So this makes it easier for consumers. So application developers will be able to easily find the topics they're looking for and can get to work straight away. Because remember, in big organizations as well, there will be hundreds of topics. So having an organized and searchable way of finding specific topics is really useful. So then clicking through the flow, it will ask Siobhan for any API she wants to add to the product. So as Siobhan will be creating has next, she doesn't have any to add just yet. So she will just click next. And she doesn't have any limitations or restrictions to apply to application developers who access the topics in this product. So she just stays with the default unlimited plan. Siobhan then chooses which application developer should be able to see the different APIs in this product. So she's going to leave this on public and she can also choose which app developers can or should get access to the APIs in this product. And she only wants authenticated users to be able to. So she's gonna stick with that here. And that's it. Siobhan has created her flight product to hold her collection of Kafka topics. So now Siobhan is ready to create and add her Kafka flight landing topic to that product. So Siobhan at Acme Air is using Event Streams um, on IBM Cloud. It's important to point out that Acme Air doesn't need to be using this. They could be running the open source Apache Kafka software themselves, or they could be using a Kafka distribution from another vendor. But as mentioned, Acme Air is using IBM Event Streams. So what Siobhan is going to do is look at the topics at Event Streams. So we can see that there is a flight landing topic which has a stream of events that is being published to it. So every time a flight lands, an event is being emitted to this topic. And clicking in the topic, you can see the payload. So this is an example of the data content and structure that application developers will be working with if they wanted to make use of this topic. So this is what Siobhan will be documenting into event endpoint management. So she starts by naming and describing the stream of events. She calls it flight landings, and she writes some descriptions to help the developers who may discover this understand what the stream of events is for and how it could be used. This is incredibly important, but sometimes I think we unappreciate the value of developer documentation. So sometimes with the description field and information field, we can't really be bothered to write anything, but this is usually the most useful part. And as we saw from our story, just the list of topic names or even just the list of field names won't be useful. We could publish plenty of APIs, but what is the point if developers can't use them easily and effectively? So APIs should be sufficiently documented to help those wanting to make use of it understand the topic. <clears throat> so that's exactly what Siobhan has done. And once she's done that, Siobhan will then provide the connection information for the Kafka cluster. So as they're using event streams, she will need to go there to get this information. So she goes to the flight landings topic and she clicks on connect to this topic to find out this information. Here, Siobhan can simply just copy the bootstrap server address and then paste it into the form. It's worth noting that different Kafka distributions will have different ways of finding this bootstrap address. But for now, Siobhan just takes that and pops it in here. Okay, so now that she's provided the connection information, Siobhan now needs to provide the name of the topic. So she enters the flight.landing title that we saw the topic had. So she's just gonna copy that. So she makes sure there's no errors and pops it in. And if Siobhan was using an Avro schema, she could provide this here. So then she doesn't have to describe the message payload later, but Siobhan doesn't have this. So the next step for her is to secure the connection between the real gateway and the backend Kafka cluster. For the security protocol, Siobhan selects SASL SSL and she then needs to provide a username and password. So to do this, she will generate some Scrum credentials. Now Siobhan could create credentials here that are unique to each application developer. So later you'll meet Andre. Siobhan knows that Andre wants to use this topic, but what if others do too? She doesn't want to have to create credentials for each person, for Andre, for Will, for a David or whoever else may want to use the topic and then change the policies and access every time for each person. Siobhan doesn't want all the people in her company that may want to use this to come and ask her, what are the connection details? Can you create me a username and password? Siobhan doesn't have time for that. She doesn't want to deal with it. So instead here, what we have is the same idea of API management just brought to the Kafka world. Here instead, Siobhan just needs to create one credential, just the one. And there we go, she's done that. So now we have a username and password that can be copied to the respective fields. So Siobhan just grabs the username that she's created, which is Acme Air, and the password that's been generated. Lovely, and she just pastes that in. So Siobhan then also needs the transport certificate too. 
This is the trust store essentially. So Siobhan will grab that from where it says PEM certificate. She can just download that and pop it into the relevant section. An important thing to note here is that these credentials will not be shown to application developers who discover and use this Kafka topic. These settings are private. These are the settings and credentials the Event Gateway service will use when it manages access to the Kafka topic. Application developers, as you will see later, will create their own credentials for their own use. They will not get to see the real address of the actual Kafka cluster and they won't get to see the security settings and credentials. So you can see here, Siobhan's popped that in. It's that PEM certificate that she's just downloaded. And clicking next, Siobhan gets to configure security for this API. Siobhan is not going to publish or share these credentials or the security information about how to connect to the real Kafka cluster because we're going to put it behind an event gateway. So that event gateway will be responsible for securely managing access to the cluster. So only the gateway is going to use these credentials. And that's what it means here when it says secure the API. And that's pretty much enough for Siobhan to get started. She's provided enough information in here now that she could actually publish this straight to the company's portal and allow other developers to start using it. But before Siobhan does that, she could add a lot more detail. So when clicking on Edit API, Siobhan will be shown a form that holds a variety of information that might be useful to help an application developer get started with this stream of events. And as I mentioned, we know how important this is. So Siobhan adds more detail to the documentation. She provides details on how developers can contact her if, she, if they need more help with this API. Again, we saw in our story at the start, the developer felt stuck because they didn't know who created the API or what it meant and they couldn't reach out to anyone who would give them a definitive answer. So Siobhan provides her own contact details here to help other developers get started if they should need it. Siobhan also provides some um, information about licensing, so she just pops that in, in there too. So as you can see, this is just the information section. There are many others in the sidebar that Siobhan can fill into. And what Siobhan is creating under the covers here is an async API document. We have just wrapped it in a web-based wizard so that people don't have to know the async API syntax. And what you see on the left hand side is that structure of the async API document that Dell went over. So you have that info, that high level background information. You have your channels where you describe your topics and you can drill down in to see the different things that you want to do with the topic. The message keys, message headers, the payloads and things like that. But Siobhan is comfortable with async API and code and she knows what she's doing. So she switches to the source view to describe the Kafka message that the Acme Air system is producing to this topic. So if Siobhan provided an Avro schema earlier, the message will have already had a very detailed description. But as Siobhan didn't do that, she's just going to add it in now. So she's had it ready in a code editor and she just pastes it into the message section here. So this section of the async API should look familiar. Dale went through it. Um, this is the channel section. So Siobhan has added in a name, a title, a summary, and a description of the message. And there's also a payload example along with the types of each property. So Siobhan doesn't want people to ask her constantly, what does this data mean? What do these different fields mean? How do I pass it? So she adds all this information here to help other developers easily understand how they could make use of it. And once she's done that, she just clicks save and that's pretty much it. So Siobhan is almost done. And to recap, she's provided a high level description of the flight landing stream of events and she's described them and how it could be used. She's given a connection and security information that the event gateway service can use to securely access that Kafka topic. She's also provided detailed descriptions of the messages on that Kafka topic. So this description, as mentioned before, is incredibly useful to help those application developers get started using it. And all of this has been captured using Async API, an open standard for documenting and describing Async APIs. So all that's pretty much left for Siobhan to do now is to publish it. So Siobhan's going to go to the top right corner and click on the menu and choose Publish. By doing this, Siobhan is publishing the document into a common place where developers know they can discover the APIs that are available to them. So Siobhan can choose which product, um, which is like the which group of related APIs this Kafka topic should be added to. So it's kind of like grouping it into folders. And she can also choose which catalog she should be publishing to as well. So Siobhan can actually also set policies to decide who is allowed to see this API, whether or not they have to ask for approval before they can start using it. So as you can see, Siobhan is completely in charge of who uses her API. Siobhan's happy with this, so now she clicks publish. 
And now she's finished. Her first Kafka topic has been published. Siobhan has socialized her Kafka topic, making it easy for other developers in her Acme Air organization to discover that they exist. So as you can see, her flight product is there and clicking on APIs in that product, she can see her flight landing API. And in the top right corner, you can see it has been published. So uh, at this point, let's flip to the other side of things where we've got a developer who might want to um, discover that that topic exists uh, and start using it. Um, so for, for this, we've got a developer called Andre. Uh, and as we've sort of mentioned, we wouldn't need them to, uh, to actually go and talk to Siobhan in person. They can discover it all through the portal. Um, so we'll briefly show you what that looks like. So this is the developer portal. This is your one-stop shop for all the types of APIs in your enterprise. So Andre logs in, and we've only got some Kafka topics in here, but you know, imagine in a real enterprise, this could be fleshed out with GraphQL APIs and REST APIs and Kafka topics all in one place, everything they might want to get to. And they'll find all of this in this API products tab. You know, An API product, a collection of, of, of APIs um, that logically have something in common. So we're going to look for that one that we just saw being created, uh, APIs relating to the flights. And you can see that little Kafka badge at the bottom telling us that the type of this API, this one's a Kafka one, an asynchronous one. So all that documentation that you saw being written before is now rendered in a friendly way. It's got that description if there was any images, markdown, uh, formatting in there, contact details. So if I run into problems as, as Andre, I know how to, to find Siobhan. I know who it is who owns the backend system. Um, I can see drilling into the, the particular where the channel is, into the information about this topic. Um, I get information about how to start consuming it. Um, the, the, my first place I'd go to is probably this reference tab where I can see the schema for the payload. You know, what fields am I going to find in the, in the events on this topic? This is what's going to tell me, is this going to be useful for the app I'm trying to build? You know, what type of data has this got? Um, is this something I can do something with? So, you know, I, at this point, I decide this does look right to me, and I can see the sample code to help me get started really efficiently in a range of languages. For now, I'm saying I'm a Java developer, so this looks good to me. I'm going to use that Get Access button to get started. There's a few different plans, you know, different types of restrictions that might have been put on it, but there's only one here, so I'm going to pick that, the default plan. I'm now going to create an application. This is what's going to represent in the developer portal the app I'm building. So Siobhan can see not only who's using her topic, but also gets to see um, you know, what app um, they're using it for. Um, these credentials are new for my app, so I'm going to copy them down because I'm not going to be able to get them again later. So uh, these are dynamically created, um, I, and I haven't needed to go and ask Siobhan for that. These are unique to my application, unique to me, generated uh, on demand from the portal. All I need to do now is confirm that this is uh, the set of APIs I want to access, uh, the type of access I've chosen, and I've got my own credentials. I'm ready to start building my application. So back in the portal, um, as I said, that sample code um, is available for each of the, the topics, for each of the types of messages I can find. So drill back into here. Um, and as I said, as, uh, as Andre, I'm, I'm going to say I'm a Java developer. So this is enough for me to get started. I'm using Eclipse here. So this is a, a Maven project. So I don't have to worry about downloading the right type of jars. You know, maybe I'm new to Kafka. Maybe this is all uh, my first time writing a Kafka app. So the portal will help me get started with this. Um, now that I've created my project, this Palm XML, um, the, where it lists all the dependencies, I can just copy straight out of the portal the list of all the dependencies that I need. And it does the same. If I was writing a Node.js app, I'd copy my package JSON. Same kind of idea, the, that manifest for the list of dependencies um, to help me start writing my app. Now that I've got the dependencies, it's time to write some code. Um, and again, I can use the sample code from the portal to help me get started with this. So I'm just going to click on the copy button by the code snippet and paste that into my editor. Now, there's one bit I do need to fill in, which is the credentials, because like I said, once your username and password is generated, that password can't be retrieved again. So I put it somewhere safe in this text editor. I'll go back in and paste that into the sample code. But otherwise, this is more or less a complete sample Hello World sort of application. Um, the, the obviously thing that the sample can't do is know what type of processing I want to do with these events. So it's just got a placeholder for that. And you can sort of see here, it leaves me at the point where I've got the deserialized message ready to do something with. So I'll go back to this references and pick out the fields that are available in these events. Uh, so there's things like the event ID, and it tells me the type of it. So I know that this is a string, so I can just get this as text. 
Um, so to just show you that, you know, doing something useful with this, maybe these are, because these are events about planes landing, um, I'm just going to print out uh, a confirmation when one of these events occurs. So I'm going to get the flight number uh, from the event, um, and I'll get the, the terminal, you know, where this flight has landed. And both of these, I know the right field name because I'm getting it from the developer portal. That's that value of that developer documentation there. And like I say, for now, we're not going to run a real app. Just to show you the kind of idea, I'm just going to print out um, that a flight with this number has landed at this particular terminal. But the point is, I went from zero, having absolutely nothing at all, to an app that's ready to run, scaffolding skeleton app, ready to add my business logic to it. And as you saw, it only took me a minute or so. So that's everything we wanted to show you. Um, that's kind of that experience for discovering that a topic exists by searching for it in a catalog, um, reading it, getting a description, getting a feel for is it the right fit for me? And having decided this is useful to me to get productive with it within a couple of minutes. So <clears throat> now that you've seen the product in use, let's take a step back and look at the architecture. So here is a common API management solution. So we have a developer portal, we have an API manager, and we have a gateway. If you're familiar with API management, then you're familiar with the concept of describing an interface, socializing that description in a portal, and specifying policies to control it. From a consumer point of view, you're probably used to a portal where you can go to that you can search and you can discover endpoints in the case of APIs that you might want to call, or in the case of stream of events that you might want to subscribe to. And a gateway that is used to essentially provide a layer of, of abstraction and an enforcement point for those policies. But API management is more than just about putting a gateway in between the application and the backend implementations. So why do you have API management? Well, you do it so that you can have control. You do it so that as the owner of those APIs, you can go and you can see who is using it, what APIs they're using, how much they're using it. You can take a look at analytics, see how many calls they're making. And you know, imagine you are Siobhan. Without API management, you could have you know, about 30 or more sets of credentials created for your Kafka topic. You've long since forgotten who's asked for which one. You've got, for example, username one two three. Who who was that for? Who, you know, why did they want it? If you needed to make a change to your API, how would you notify them that maybe that topic, that that data is going to change shape in the future? And it's not that we can't create credentials for a Kafka cluster today. Of course we can, but. What this management layer brings us is as you scale and as your maturity of adoption of Kafka grows, this management is essential. So as you can see here, we have taken inspiration from API management. So for event endpoint management, um, as you've just seen, it's the same kind of setup. You know, we have the developer portal. That's what Andre used. We have a manager, which is you know, where you can go and describe your endpoints. That's what Siobhan used to describe her flight landing API. You know, the biggest impact here is cultural. It's around maturity and it's around control, but it's more than just about putting a gateway in between. In the same way as API management, there is discovery. How did Andre know that a specific topic exists in the first place without having to be friends with Siobhan and ask her? How do you get the connection details that you need? There are so many different ways to configure it, to configure the different security models. You know, how did Andre know what config options to use? Again, without having to go and pester Siobhan. The fact that you can get all that connection information in the config, you can create yourself credentials in a self sign up way and all of that documentation as a whole that's the value that it brings but having said that the event gateway is very very important it's more than just transparently proxying data between the applications and the back-end kafka cluster it plays that really important role by enforcing policies transparently on the kafka protocol let's Let's have a look at a couple of examples of that. I'm not going to go exhaustively through everything the Event Gateway does, but um, I've chosen a couple of examples of of how it, of the role that it plays to give you a flavour for, for, for the sorts of work it's doing. Um, quick bit of context for those of you who perhaps are a little new to Kafka. Um, Kafka has this idea of consumer groups. So if you're scaling up your application to cope with a large throughput of messages, you can run multiple instances of your app in parallel. Uh, that might be multiple processes, or it might like be physically different machines. Like if you're in Kubernetes, maybe it's uh, uh, scaling up a deployment with multiple pods, something like that. 
And what Kafka will do, as I've tried to show in this diagram here, is divide up the, the different partitions that make up the topic um, across your different instances of the app. So if you have fewer instances of, of your app, then there are topic partitions. It will, it will send events from more than one of them to, to an instance. It will make sure that all those events get processed. Um, the problem would lie, and, the, and this is fine as long as all the instances of the app are being run by developers who are talking to each other. So here I've got Alice and Bob. Alice and Bob are in the same team. They work together. Alice knows that all of her apps should be marked as being in group A, and Bob knows that all of his apps should be marked as being in group B. But in a world where you're using something like event employee management and developers are discovering the Kafka topics in a in a catalog, and they've never met and don't know of the other developers who might be consuming events from this topic, then you can't rely on Alice and Bob talking to each other and coordinating in that way. Um, the gateway needs to help with that. Um, and just to sort of underline that point, so if the event gateway was just a, a proxy, um, then you would get something like this happening if Alice and Bob accidentally pick the same group ID. Particularly, you know, if they're both starting from sample code, you know, we've all taken that sample code that's got a consumer group baked into it and just run that code as is. And what you would have is something like this, where Kafka trying to be helpful in dividing up the, the, the topic partitions between the, the instances of the app will see all of these as being part of one big group. So Alice's app will get two thirds of the messages, two thirds of the events from this topic, and Bob's app will only see one third. Neither of them are going to get what they want. So what the, uh, what the event gateway does is ensure isolation by under the covers as the events are going back and forth, as the negotiation occurs between the applications and the Kafka clusters, it's rewriting things like the group ID to ensure that they're unique so that um, even if Alice and Bob, who never meet each other, accidentally choose the same group ID, they never need to notice their applications aren't affecting each other um, because the gateway is ensuring isolation. And consumer group ID is one example of this, but there's a whole load of other things in a similar sort of vein that the gateway is doing to, to make sure that this all works smoothly. Let's look at one other use case. And again, sort of if you're a bit new to, to the Kafka protocol, I, I'll sort of explain the context here. Because Kafka is a distributed system, you have multiple brokers that make up the Kafka cluster. Um, when an application first connects, it doesn't know where the topic that it's interested in lives. You know, it, it's going to connect to one of the brokers at random. It will make what's called a metadata request. It will say, I'm, I'm looking for topic X. Please tell me which of the brokers I should be talking to. And then whichever broker randomly receives that request, it knows uh, it will know the state of the cluster. And it will be able to reply saying, ah, the topic you're interested in is on broker Y. You need to disconnect from me and reconnect to broker Y and then start consuming. And that's the, the handshake that occurs when a, an application first connects to a Kafka cluster. Now, if, the, if all we had was a transparent proxy, an application would connect via the, the, the gateway proxy. Um, that would be passed on to the Kafka broker and essentially it would be asking, where is the topic that I'm interested in? And that Kafka broker would reply with the actual address of the real broker that's hosting the topic. And then the application following normal Kafka protocol would disconnect and make a new connection bypassing the proxy directly to that backend Kafka broker. So if this is going to remain effective, if it's going to stay in this role of enforcing access and ensuring, you know, enforcing that uh, auth authentication using the credentials that have been dished out through the portal, then we need to rewrite that response, that metadata request. When the broker responds with, here's where the topic lives, that needs to be rewritten. So when it gets passed to the application, it still looks like the address of the gateway in a, in a form that will allow the request to be correctly routed to the correct broker. And again, this isn't an exhaustive list. It's an idea of the kind of thing the gateway is doing. The gateway needs to be aware of the Kafka protocol so that it can rewrite requests and responses going back to ensure isolation, to ensure that it remains in front of the Kafka cluster so that it can continue to protect it. Um, this isn't the sort of thing that as a user you would ever need to know, but we wanted to highlight this to give you a bit of a feel for the kind of work the gateway is doing. And to underline that point, and going back to the diagram Sam was showing earlier, of, of how analogous this is to API management, to, to serve that role of being a gateway in, in a Kafka world is more than just transparently proxying requests through. So I think that was everything we wanted to cover. Um, Hopefully that's been a useful uh, intro. Um, hopefully uh, you've got a feel for, for the role that event employee management could play, particularly if you've uh, started to grow your usage of, of Kafka. 
Um, and if you've got any more questions, I've seen there's a couple in the chat, so we can uh, start answering some of them. Um, and I'll hand over to Brian to, to wrap up. All right. Thank you, Dale. And uh, and again, we do have uh, one question in the chat right now that's not answered. Um, not sure if uh, we want to, we can give a complete answer or we need I, to I take that. Office that, that, that. First. Okay. I could, so if you've already got APIC, um, uh, sorry, I should stop using acronyms. If you've got API Connect, uh, API Management Solution, um, I mentioned when I was showing the developer portal that one of the strengths of, of, of doing this is in a way where it's all one-stop one shop, everything under one roof. There is a benefit to being able to manage all of your flavors of API in one place. So if you've already got your REST APIs and your GraphQL APIs and all of that sort of stuff in one place, yes, um, uh, as part of the Cloud Pack for integration, you can extend that installation to add in support for, for, for Kafka. All that gets you is an additional, um, what, some extra UI bits to do the authoring of the async API documents as Salma was demoing. Um, and it also gets you the deployment of that Kafka aware gateway, that event gateway that I was just talking about. So yes, you don't need to start from scratch um, if you've got through Cloud Pack for integration, if you've got API Connect, you can add in support for this Kafka piece um, all under one roof. We do have two more questions, and actually now three, so they're starting to come in uh, fast and furious. So the next one is a very good question. Can we use a similar approach for IBM MQ as for Kafka? Not today. Um, we are really interested in this, and uh, and my colleagues in MQ have been working on async API has this uh, concept of bindings, where uh, although most of the most of the spec is agnostic of technology, any time you want to do something that's very specific to the technology, you put that in what's called a binding. Um, and uh, my colleagues, particularly Rich Coppen in MQ, um, wrote a binding for for describing the MQ specific bits. So if you want to describe your queues and your topics. Um, you can do that in an async API document because of the extension that he's uh, written and contributed to async API. Um, now, the, the bit we're missing is we don't have support for that in, like we don't have a gateway that's uh, able to do all that stuff I was just talking about that's MQ aware. So yes, you can describe your MQ queues and topics with async API, but we don't have support for that in event endpoint management today. All right, the next question is, event gateway bound to the use of Kafka or event streams or can it be used with IBM MQ? Okay, so that's the same. Well, you just answered there. It's yeah. worth underlining, though, it's not tied to event streams. If you've, and I think Sam already mentioned this, but just to, to echo the point, um, if you've got any other flavor of Kafka or anything that looks like Kafka, um, because there are some uh, things that support the Kafka protocol, the event gateway will happily sit in front of that. It doesn't need to be event streams. It could be vanilla open source Apache Kafka. All right, and then the next one is, is Event Gateway for Kafka native clients or for the REST Kafka clients as well? Um, so it's for the Kafka protocol, so it's for Kafka clients. You know, if you are using something like a REST producer to put messages onto a Kafka topic by making HTTP calls, then you could describe that with an open API document and then put that in a more traditional API Connect kind of way. And then that would go through API Connect's gateway, the data power gateway. So you, if you wanted to support um, HTTP clients to put messages onto Kafka topics, you can do that. You don't need the event gateway and you don't need async API to be able to do that. But I think it's a really good idea. And definitely there are developers who would appreciate that option being available to them. Okay, yeah, great, Dale, thank you. Any last questions, anybody? While I'm waiting for those to come in, a few reminders, please complete the post-session survey. We really want uh, your feedback, so you know, we continue to improve uh, the TechCon conference every year. And um, also take a look at, uh, you know, as you, you see at the end of most of our sessions you'll see a a link to the ibm community which is a great place for you to you know participate you know, really forums uh blogs from our developers um web uh cast and um you know, all kinds of great uh information there and uh if you want to get hands-on with any of our integration technologies, including what you saw here in this session today. 
We are running integration proof of technologies in the, the U.S. right now with uh, ones upcoming in Atlanta and uh, Dallas, as well as um, Buffalo and uh, Phoenix. So, uh, you know, if you have any interest in them, again, some of those are linked to on the end of our uh, presentation decks and also you know, feel free to reach out to to me or to any of your your you know, technical uh, account team, and they will help you get uh, signed up. And it doesn't look like any other questions came in, so I guess we can uh, call it a a wrap and that uh, everybody prepare for uh, the last session of the day. And if you're staying in the the API uh, management track. That will be um, kind of following up on uh, the previous session here, where we're going to dive in further into the steps then, and uh, in a session called "Unlock New Potential with API Connect and Steps In." So that should be a fabulous session. Uh, I look to seeing you there. Thanks, everybody.